<clears throat> Good morning to each and every one of you. I want to begin by thanking John and uh, his colleagues at UW for, for hosting this symposium and for including me. Uh, the next two talks are really going to take a deep dive into the challenging issue of sudden death, and I've been asked to begin by talking a little bit about etiology. Um, etiology and incidence are intimately uh, intertwined in this topic, so I will spend a bit of time talking about incidence and what we've learned in, the, in, in that uh, arena, but I'll leave much of that, particularly around the young athletes and some of the variant issues, to, to Dr. Harmon, who will be following. Um, here are my affiliations and funding sources, some of which are relevant to this talk for full disclosure. So for those of us in this business, um, we've all been touched in one way, uh, one way or form by sudden death, and each of us have our, our specific cases that we remember. Um, none of them are more tragic than the other, but this is one that was particularly uh, important to me. Ryan Shea was a, a friend and an old training partner who um, was one of the hardest working athletes I've ever known. He was um, vying for a spot on the Olympic marathon team in 2007, towed the line at the Olympic marathon trials in Central Park and collapsed just after mile five was in cardiac arrest and unfortunately could not be resuscitated. Um, when people like Ryan die during sports, um, it attracts a lot of attention. And, and there are three principal questions that are always asked, and here, here they are. First is, what is the scope of the problem? And this is really a function of incidence, meaning when we think about this problem uh, in the context of all the other things we face as health healthcare professionals, sports medicine doctors, sports cardiologists, should we care about this? The second is, what is the cause of this problem, meaning what diseases can we attribute sudden death to? And then third, fortunately, I'm not going to be speaking about this this morning, and that is, is there a viable path to prevention, either through screening or through developments of emergency acts and plans? So let's begin by looking at some incidence data. To understand this graph is to understand both the challenges inherent in the study of cardiac death as well as some of the progress that's been made over the last several decades. These are data that were published by uh, Dr. Barry Marin's group out of uh, Minnesota uh, in which he compiled case reports of sudden death during sport among athletes in this country over a 25-year period. And what you can see here is that over the period of time study, there was a, a relatively steady and quite noticeable increase in the number of deaths that were, were captured. Uh, if you look at the distribution as a function of cause, you can see that regardless of what year you're looking at, that the majority of these deaths, at least 50%, were due to underlying cardiovascular disease. Now, it's tempting to look at this graph and think that the incidence of sudden death is, is an epidemic on the rise, but I would submit that this has less to do with the actual change in incidence and more to do with the function of ascertainment and the ability to collect these cases. But nonetheless, this graph, uh, which is infamous in this business, is one of, the, one of the sentinel papers, and it produced an incidence statistic of roughly 1 in 200,000. Now, I will call your attention to the fact that this data set was comprised of almost exclusively of high school athletes. So for a long period of time, uh, when people asked us how commonly do high school student athletes die, these were our best incident statistics, and it actually looked like a relatively rare event. Uh, to give um, credit to both Kim and John, this study was published last year, and I think very much changed our appreciation for the risk at the high school level. Um, this, was a, this was an incredibly well done study, and what this study did, how it advanced the field is that it really, for the first time in the high school literature, paid attention to issues around numerators and denominators in a much more responsible way. And what you can see here looking at state sudden cardiac arrest and deaths is that they were able to calculate statewide uh, incident statistics uh, looking at both males and females and were able to come up with a number that was much different from the one that we saw previously. So a threefold higher increase in sudden death risk compared to the earlier literature by Marin. Um, I'll leave Kim to talk about this in more detail, but it appears that as the level at which an athlete plays increases and becomes more intense, that the risk of sudden cardiac death goes up. These are data from the NCAA registry, and again, the, uh, there are some important uh, aspects of variability in here, which Kim will talk about, but the number from college athletes looks to be approximately 1 in 43,000 athletes will die over the course of their career. Um, in sports medicine, sports cardiology, the vast majority of our patients are actually not high school, collegiate, and professional athletes. They're men and women above the age of 35 who maintain athletic identities and stay fit and participate in master's athlete sports. And these are an important group for us to understand from a sudden death perspective, and they're actually very, very different from the younger populations. 
These are data that come from the RACER study, which I had the opportunity to lead, which looked at sudden deaths in marathons and half marathons in our country over a decade period of time, and we learned quite a bit from this study. Um, the first was that um, gender is an important determinant of sudden death. I won't beat this to death because I know Kim is going to talk about this. Um, but what we learned from the RACER study, really, I think for the first time, is that when an athlete goes down in the, in the midst of a sport competition, their likelihood of survival is far higher than when people die in other public places. So when you look at save rates in places like shopping malls, casinos, um, airports, you're lucky if you see a 5 to 7 percent discharge out of hospital survival with intact neurologic function. And in our study, we saw that that rate was closer to 30 percent. The other thing that we learned from this study is that incident rates are not static. And if you look at the number of men who run marathons and, the, and their incidence of having cardiac arrest over the period we studied, there was a triple in, tripling in the increase from the first five to the second five years of study. Now there's a lot of speculation as to why this might have occurred, but I think the most logical explanation is that the demographics of men that are turning to marathon running has changed quite dramatically. This used to be the purview of very fit elite athletes, but now many folks are turning to this sport as a bucket list sort of activity and oftentimes doing so with undiagnosed subclinical atherosclerotic coronary disease, which probably could be picked up if they had been seen and evaluated by a competent clinician. Um, triathlon has received a bit of attention recently. Um, this was the first study looking at the incidence of sudden death in triathletes. It came from Kevin Harris and, and Barry Marin again from Minneapolis. Um, and their sudden death statistic here was 1.5 triathletes per 100,000 would die. And as you can see here in this initial report, the vast majority of, of this occurs on the swim. And hold that in mind because as we advance to the more recent study, you're going to see that this trend bears out. Um, this was just recently published. This was an update on their triathlon database. And again, this was an attempt to look at both the incidence and the etiology of death among triathletes, which are um, by definition an older group in this study. The mean age was in the 40s. So again, we're not talking about young athletes. We're talking about older athletes. And what you can see here is that the death rate as a function of age is very, very important with increasing age being associated with increased risk of sudden death during triathlon. Their incident statistic was 1.74 per 100,000, so actually quite close to the 1.5 that they got in their prior smaller study. I like this graph. Um, this graph attempts to put incident statistics um, together into one list to show the sum of the variability. Unfortunately, they got the incident statistic from the RACER study incorrectly, but it is what it is. But what you can see here is that when you look across a function of different studies uh, and different athletes, different uh, competition levels, that incident statistics vary quite dramatically. Uh, what about people that aren't really athletes, that are just out in the community exercising, playing pickup ball, or going to the gym? Well, it appears that they're at relatively high risk compared to other populations. This is a, a study that looked at the incidence of sudden cardiac death in people that, again, were just recreationally active. And you can see that um, sports-associated sudden cardiac arrest most often occurred in public places. They were more, more often witnessed, and they more, were more often recipients of bystander CPR. And in fact, people that had their cardiac arrest in the context of physical activity uh, did better, probably because of the early intervention attributes that I just discussed. Again here, similar to what we've seen in, in prior data, about 1 in 48,000 people in the general community who are active will succumb to sudden cardiac death. And then finally, probably the most concerning group that we have to think about are, are our active military recruits. These are data from Bob Eckert and uh, Bill Stevenson. Bill Stevenson's a Boston-based cardiologist who's done a lot of work, a lot of pioneering work in the, in the military sudden death literature. And this is a, a tabulation of, of incident statistics uh, with a focus on the influence of atherosclerotic coronary disease and active military recruits. And what you can see here is that the, as the age of the military men and women go up, so too do the incidence of sudden cardiac death. And about at the age of 35, there's a switch, and this is my transition into the etiology part, portion of this talk, there's a switch in the cause of death from underlying genetic and structural heart disease to acquired coronary artery disease. And men who ma maintain uh, active military status into their 40s and 50s are at, are, are at extremely high risk of this outcome. So if you look at the um, incident statistics I've just reviewed in some detail, when p you'll, you'll understand uh, by looking at this chart that when someone asks you how common is sudden death, the answer is, well, it depends on which population you're talking about. So causality, why does this happen? I want to start by making an important point, and that is we do not fully understand causality. We understand diseases that are detected after someone dies, 
particularly diseases that are detected on autopsy, but that is not necessarily, necessarily causality. So be careful when you ascribe a disease process and say that it caused sudden death. Now it's logical when someone dies and they have an abnormal autopsy to as assume a cause and effect relationship, but I just want everyone to just take a step back and realize that, that from a rigorous scientific perspective that may not, may not actually be accurate. Um, going back to, to Dr. Marin's initial study, uh, again, here is where we go from incidence to etiology, and you can see that over the roughly 1,800 sudden deaths that, that he was able to tabulate in young people, uh, more than half of those were due to underlying cardiovascular diseases, or at least had underlying cardiovascular diseases detected at autopsy. This study is probably the one that has, uh, deserves the most credit for placing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so genetic heart disease causing thickening of the heart muscle, myofibril disarray, electrical instability as the leading cause of sudden death. And as you'll see, although that is the conventional teaching, that has been challenged recently. But this list across the bottom of the screen, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anomalous coronaries, um, left ventricular hypertrophy, not clearly HCM, but possibly, probably, and then a variety of other things myocarditis, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, some of the primary electrical disturbances were things that were found during this series. But far and away from, if you look at this database alone, it, one would conclude that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the single most important thing that we need to think about when we think about risk in young athletes. Um, we learned quite a bit about incidents, and I think this represented in some respects a paradigm shift in our understanding of why athletes died from, from the NCAA work that again was led by Kim and John. Um, you'll see here in this pie chart that the largest chunk of this pie is attributable to a slice labeled SUD, or sudden unexplained death. And that meant that these were men and women who died, uh, had autopsies, and there was no apparent cause of death. So something about these people caused them to drop dead on the field, but when their chests were open and their hearts were examined, there was no evidence to suggest that any of the key etiologies that were suggested by Marin's original work was there. So this, this has important implications, particularly when we think about our ability to screen and prevent sudden death. But again, the concept that structurally normal hearts can lead to death was really, I think, put onto, the, onto all of our radar screen uh, elegantly by this study. Um, when we think about older athletes again and we talk about etiology, there's a very clear breakpoint somewhere in the mid-30s. And etiology also dictates survival. So here's the pie chart from our marathon database. And what you can see here is that everyone that was shaded in blue was a non-survivor and everyone shaded in red was a survivor. Survivors on average were 15 years older than non-survivors, and when you start looking at the diseases that they had, there's a, an interesting story there. So most of the young people had some form of structural heart disease. Again, big hearts due to either definitive or probable hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I will say there was about a 20% rate of people that had structurally normal hearts, so again, that's consistent with the NCAA database, meaning that people that have no overt disease can die. But what was most interesting is that the older folks almost all had coronary disease, and these older folks were typically much more responsive to intervention in the field. So these people did better when they were defibrillated. These people tended to live longer if they got uh, bystander CPR. And these were the people that really represented our survival piece of the pie. Um, <clears throat> again, with, with respect to the military, the, the story is quite clear. And I think when you think about this age dichotomization, this study shows this quite nicely with 35 years of age being an important break point. Um, again, here, the, the, the concept of sudden unexplained death, particularly in young people, was, uh, was illustrated quite nicely. And that is, these are people that died and were studied uh, quite well and, and were not able to attribute any cause of death to their demise. Uh, but you see some of the common things here. So again, in older folks, atherosclerotic coronary disease being really the dominant factor and then some of the structural problems being more common in young people. Um, I want to say a quick word about triathlon again because this is a, a, a topic that many of our patients come to us and ask about. They ask how dangerous is the triathlon? Where do my problems occur and why do people get into trouble? And the answer is, is that there is no one single answer. So as I showed you earlier in the talk, most of the sudden death cases that occur during triathlon occur during the swim. And indeed, underlying cardiac disease is responsible for a portion of those, probably not all of them. Any of you that have ever watched or participated in a triathlon realize that triathletes have a tendency to swim over one another rather than next to one another. So simple drowning is a real issue. There's also an entity that we're really just starting to understand in, in detail, and that is this issue of swimming-induced pulmonary edema. It's a non-cardiogenic form of pulmonary edema that tends to affect women, tends to affect women around the menopausal time period, so between 40 and 50. 
55 or so. It tends to be more prevalent in women swimming in cold water and also women who wear wetsuits. So if you spend any time around the finish line of a triathlon, particularly in between T1 and T2, you'll see people come out of the water unusually short of breath. And this is the, this is the problem that they're typically suffering from. If this occurs early in the swim and there's not a, a prompt response by emergency medical crews, this can be a, this can be a cause of death. So we're, again, we're just starting to learn about this, but this is quite important. But you can see here that in older folks, again, masters athletes, that the dominant cause of sudden death is, again, atherosclerotic coronary disease, which as clinicians presents us with, uh, with many opportunities for prevention. So when we summarize causes and we think about what gets people into trouble, I would say that the jury is partially still out. Um, not so much for older people. I think it's quite clear, and this is a consistent signal across the literature, that older men and women who drop dead during athletic activity do so because of acquired coronary artery disease nine out of ten times. Um, where the jury remains hung is in this issue of younger athletes. Again, the conventional wisdom is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the dominant cause of death, but I think some of the recent series that have been published um, challenge that notion and suggest that perhaps it's not always big, thick hearts that do this, but perhaps young people that have structurally normal hearts, either with some clearly definable uh, channelopathy or perhaps some electrical un instability that we don't yet understand, uh, account for a significant number of these deaths. You know, why are we in this situation where we don't understand? Well, there, there are th two basic reasons. One is that autopsy data are rare. Um, as most of you are well aware, autopsies have dwindled over time in the general population, and this has been the case among sudden death cases in young athletes. So one of the most important public health things we can do in our local communities is remind people of the importance of autopsy when there are tragedies, particularly tragedies in the context of sport. The other issue is that autopsies are imperfect. So uh, even the best pathologist will tell you that examining a body post-mortem only gives you about half the story with respect to why someone died. So we have to take autopsy data with a grain of salt. I do think that the biggest advance in autopsy data that, we've na that we're now seeing, which will become more and more a, a standard of care, is the concept of genetic or molecular autopsies, in which it's not only inspection of the gross architecture of the heart and blood vessels, but really a deep dive into the tissue to understand some of these things that don't manifest with structural changes. So fair to say, <coughs> whether it's increasing the number of autopsies we do, or increasing the quality and the technique with which we apply to autopsies, we have a lot of work to do. So I will conclude there and thank you for your attention.